Howdy guys, Jimmy Song here. Welcome to another episode of Bitcoin Tech Talk. Pound that like button so more people can discover this content. In this episode, we're gonna go through Trace Mare, the Ethereum split, a uh, bunch of stuff about stock to flow, which will be our long read. Anyway, um, uh, Bitcoin Tech Talk is a newsletter I send out every Monday. It's uh, recently been reformatted to be a more narrative um, newsletter uh, and I send it out every Monday so if you are not subscribed click the link below to subscribe um, also if you don't like reading but you do like watching you can always subscribe to this channel um, and tell your friends about it uh, you know do uh, do something like that anyway uh, before I go uh, uh, before I start I wanted to start out in this full video because I got this card from uh, Crypto Tycoon. It's uh, apparently like some sort of card game and I have a character. Does it look like me? I don't know. Um, anyway, it's it's kind of cool. Um, just wanted to give them a shout out because they gave me this and I like the art. So, all right. Uh, that's, uh, let's, uh, let's go on to some of the stuff before we get started. So I will be at the Bitcoin 2020 conference which they are now canceling for coronavirus. I think I've had like three conferences already cancel on me because of all the different uh, viruses, or, or mainly because of that one virus. Uh, but Bitcoin 2020 is continuing to happen. They're gonna have a bunch of stations with lots of sanitizing hand things and stuff. I imagine most people will be fist bumping and so on, um, or foot bumping instead of shaking hands, but it is going to still happen. Um, this is my book, Programming Bitcoin, and it is available on Amazon. And it is, uh, you know, a nice little way to, uh, you know, learn about Bitcoin uh, from my book. Uh, this is uh, more for, you know, non-technical people, but it is uh, now right on sale for eleven ninety one. dollars uh, It is the Little Bitcoin book, and you can also buy it on Amazon. It's also available in audiobook. Portuguese, Spanish, I swear we're getting more languages. It's just taking some time. And of course, my seminar programming blockchain is happening very soon. Um, it is actually right before the Bitcoin 2020 conference. So with all that said, let's go back to the story. All right, so the main story this week was Trace Mayor and the perils of being a non-technical regime. It takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to ruin it. And that's a quote from Warren Buffett. Now, I don't, I don't really respect Warren Buffett that much. He's very good at rent seeking and uh, investing in banks and so on that make, you know, essentially all his money is made off of uh, fiat rent seeking. Uh, but the, the quote is very apt. Uh, it takes 20 years to build a reputation, five minutes to ruin it. And in the case of Chase Mayer, He's been in the Bitcoin space for over 10 years and he ruined it pretty much last weekend. And that was um, not this past weekend, but the one before at Unconfiscatable. And, uh, and basically he was shilling Mimble Wimble coin at the Unconfiscatable conference. And, uh, and this was kind of a shocker to most people, including myself. Um, he came up to me at one point and he was telling me, hey, did you get the latest airdrop? I was like, uh, I thought it was, he was talking about Handshake, which I wrote about in another newsletter. Uh, I was like, yeah, I claimed the Handshake one. He's like, no, 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 there's one called Mimble Wimble Coin. I'm like, what's Mimble Wimble Coin? He's like, well, um, whatever it was, you know, you could get something like, right now, each uh, Bitcoin that got uh, got airdropped like $1,500 with the Mimble Wimble Coin. And my eyes lit up. I was like, what? I need to get in on this so I could dump the crap out of it. Uh, he's like, oh, but it's over. And, you know, they might have another one uh, for like more people later. I was like, OK, that sounds suspicious. And then right at that point, I had to uh, go up on stage and present the scammies and then head to the airport because more or less that was, um, you know, what, what what happened. So but he was shilling it at Unconfiscatable. Remember, this is the Bitcoin, not blockchain conference. This is like. There, if you're shilling anything other than Bitcoin, you are going to get shot down. And he, that was very, very surprising to almost everybody. Anyway, uh, some details about Mimblewimble coin. It's a clone of Grin. And Grin is one of two implementations of Mimblewimble that came out in January of 2019. And uh, Beam is the other one. Beam came out a little bit before. Uh, but uh, the, the clone of Grin um, was made so that they could have a 50% pre-mine. So, it, unlike, say, Z Classic or something like that, which removed the pre-mine, this one actually added a pre-mine. 
and they uh, they launched I think in like November of 2019, so uh, about four months ago. Anyway, um, to make uh, it more popular, they decided to airdrop it to holders of Bitcoin, but only if they registered. So unlike Bitcoin Cash or something like that, where you got it whether you wanted it or not, um, with uh, with Mimblewimble Coin, you have to actually um, register your uh, Bitcoin address. Now, like there's a lot of irony in that, right? Like you're supposed to be a privacy coin and you're forcing people to reveal their Bitcoin addresses and and dump them coins that way. So it, it, there, there's a lot of irony uh, around that, but it, it looks like most people didn't care. I, I, I certainly didn't know about it and I, I don't think many people in the Bitcoin community did. So um, Trace Mayer is probably one of the few people that actually cared. And uh, after he registered, he, um, I mean, I know he has a lot of Bitcoin. So, and he's a whale that's been accumulating since like 25 cents. So he, he's got a ton of Bitcoin and he, that means that like it was a smaller pool than like the 21 million or like I, I guess there's about 18 million uh, Bitcoins that are in existence. I'm guessing less than a million actually registered for this, uh, probably even less than that. So Chase Mayer has a significant amount of Bitcoin and if he registered his uh, uh, his coins, then essentially he got an insane number of Mimble Wimble coin because it was shared among the people that registered and uh, about half was uh, was pre-mined and I think some significant percentage like 60 or 70 was airdropped to those people. Uh, so it's pretty clear that he got uh, airdropped like a significant amount of Mimble Wimble coin. And what he was telling me at the conference was that each Bitcoin got you about $1,500 of Mimble Wimble coin. And at the time, Mimble Wimble coin was worth about 30 bucks. So, um, I mean, it's dropped like 50% since then, but assuming it's about 30 bucks, so he probably got like 50 Mimble Wimble coin for every Bitcoin that he had. So, um, I mean, say he has like 100,000, that would be like 5 million. Well, that, that would be like a significant part of the pre mine. So that, that would be a quarter of all Mimble Wimble coin. So maybe not that much. Uh, say, say he has like 50,000, then he would have like um, two and a half million, which would be more than 10% of all Mimble Wimble coins. So he has some financial incentive to, um, to uh, shill this coin. And, you know, essentially he, he started to talk about the coin in every interview right after this. And I didn't catch this because I don't watch interviews with Trace Mary necessarily, uh, but he, he started shilling it even in our confiscatable. And there are a couple of videos where he mentions it outright. Um, and, you know, the thing is, he can do whatever he wants, right? But, like, his endorsement of Mimble Wimble coin is just the path that a lot of non-technical Bitcoin OGs have taken. And I, I list them here, Roger Ver, Vinny Lingham, Jeff Berwick, Rock, Rick Falkving, uh, uh, Krista Rose. Um, Roger Ver was doing it way before Bitcoin Cash, by the way. He was really into Monero. He was really into Zcash. He was really into Dash. He was really into zero coin and many others. Um, he 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 got into all of them uh, beforehand. Um, but uh, the thing I want to point out is that Mimble Wimble Coin is actually a technical mess, uh, and they had some serious issues with their Bitcoin wallet. And I had to archive this uh, it, it, right here because basically they Hotbit actually took this post down, and the reason why they took it down was because they got bribed by Mimble Wimble Coin, and they uh, and basically. Um, they lost about 90,000 Mimble Wimble coin. And at the time, it was tra trading at like 30 bucks. So th this is not a small amount of money. It's uh, like $2.7 million or something like that. Um, anyway, they, they investigated and they found that there were a, a couple of 51% attacks that their wallet, which they got from the Mimble Wimble coin team, was uh, not detecting the 51% attack. It didn't have a good rollback thing. So uh, it, it ended up um, uh, causing a significant, significant harm to this one exchange that actually had Mimble Wimble coin. And a lot of people like uh, basically, you know, they, they document absolutely everything and, uh, and they, they complained about it. And this was like February 26th. And if you, um, if you linked, if you look at the status with Hotbit, according to the Mimble Wimble Coin website, we have spoken with Hotbit regarding the recent announcement. We will release more details about what actually happened later. But for now, we have discussed using some of the unclaimed airdrop funds to make Hotbit and Hotbit users whole. So basically, they're bribing Hotbit 
uh, to not speak badly about them. And if you go to the announcement page, it has nothing, right? This is why I had to archive it because uh, this, this is what used to be on there and this is what's there now. And it's a, it's a link back to the same exact thing, right? Um, so the, it's a technical mess. They, uh, it, it's really hard to do rollbacks on Mimblewimble coin because, well, anything Mimblewimble because you don't have a blockchain. You, you basically have just cut throughs and stuff like that. So um, to roll it back, you, you have to keep the state of like however many blocks or how, however many uh, blocks essentially that came through, but you don't keep the blocks. You're supposed to cut them through. So it, it's uh, like rolling it back is not technically easy. And uh, no wonder they didn't, you know, like take care of this particular case very well. And as a result, they ended up losing a ton of coins, 90,000 of them. In a way, uh, it's a sad commentary on non-technical Bitcoin OGs as nearly all of them have gone on to other projects, not understanding Bitcoin at a technical level or even not being able to distinguish good versus bad developers causes many of these OGs to go astray. The siren songs of something better and more profits seem to lure all of them given enough time. And this is a sad reality, right? And this is why I do this show. I want you guys to be technical um, to the best uh, of your ability because otherwise you're going to fall for these scams or think that you know better just because you hit it big on Bitcoin. Um, and we're all going to hit it big on Bitcoin. And uh, there's going to be plenty of other scams that come along. But they're going to have to go find another audience because Bitcoin people are clearly not interested. But the, uh, but this is the pattern that happens to a lot of people. They they, they think they know more than they do because, um, yeah, and it's kind of hubris because they're not really technical. They don't really understand what the hell's going on. I mean, like Chase was like... Um, pounding on coin joints for a long time and i was always wondering about this it was because he was he was trying to uh argue for mimblewimble and uh, and the thing is like uh that mimblewimble itself has a lot of problems and uh, there, there's a lot of things that are kind of wrong about it and if it, if it's actually useful it'll make its way to bitcoin as a side chain or something and that, that that's the key all right um so Peter Woolley has uh, posted a bunch of updates to BIP340, and this is um, this is Taproot, specifically the Schnorr BIP. And, uh, and he, he makes a number of changes, which he summarizes right here. The tiebreaker for public keys with implicit Y coordinate is changed from square to even. The nonce generation function is improved to take certain failure scenarios into account. Recommendations around using of signing, time randomness, and verifications are strengthened. The tags are updated to make sure accidental use of earlier draft code breaks consistently. So a um, lot, lot of good stuff. And uh, he, he wrote it in a Bitcoin dev post here. And essentially, he, he talked up, talks about like the justification for doing all of this. It's, uh, it, it's based on some like uh, some stuff like to the modern. Uh, well, I guess I guess that's not there anymore. Uh, but like some some of the stuff for public keys and, and, and things like that, which uh, uh, you know, you want to prevent as many attacks as possible. So um, he's taking these recommendations into account and doing it. Um, and that's that's great. The, this, uh, it'll make it more backwards compatible with like sort of BIP32 and HD libraries and ECC libraries and so on. Because even evenness and oddness is pretty easy to check. Squareness is not so easy to check. You have to do a square root, um, which uh, in a finite field uh, is a little more expensive than evenness or oddness. Uh, nonce generation, um, it, it takes away a bunch of attack vectors. It turns out a deterministic nonce can um, have some holes, which we'll talk a little bit about with Stepan's uh, post. Uh, Suhas uh, Daptuar, he's from Chinko Labs. Um, he, has a, he has a proposal to support relaying transactions based on their witness transaction ID, which, uh, which is great uh, because Essentially, um, SegWit transactions are still transmitting their legacy transaction ID, which makes it unmalleable. But at the same time, that makes it very difficult uh, because uh, the witness can be anything and it could actually be in, uh, make the entire transaction invalid. So what, uh, what nodes are doing right now is downloading those transactions um, no matter what. Uh, like Even if they've seen it before, that they, they'll re-download it just in case it's valid this time. Uh, so it's a, it's kind of an attack vector, and he wants to close it by um, uh, having some sort of service bit that says, okay, I, I'm going to only relay witness transaction IDs and not transaction IDs. That way you can check um, and, you know, like download only the ones that are actually new instead of uh, re-downloading bad ones over and over again. Uh, so that um, that's a very good proposal. I hope it gets in. 
Uh, Stefan Snigurev has come out with a non-blinding scheme. So there are certain, um, uh, like there, there's a whole K or uh, a nonce that you have to choose whenever you sign. And if you reuse that in any way, you're, you lose your private key. So like security around the nonce is extremely important. But there's also other ways in which you can, you can leak some data with the nonce. And this is specifically to protect against compromised hardware. So if you have, um, say, a coal card or a treasure or a ledger or something like that, and it's been compromised, in some way, so it's it still signs valid transactions and so on. There are ways um, in which you can uh, compromise the firmware inside to uh, use a nonce so that you slowly leak out the private key. Um, and in doing so, you may just sort of lose your fund. So to mitigate against that particular form of an attack, and you can imagine like if somebody is securing um, a ton of money using a hardware wallet and if some attacker has access to your wallet for five minutes and installs this firmware, uh, they may be able to go and get your private key and you can lose all your Bitcoins. This is a way to mitigate that. It's a little bit more complicated because uh, as you can see in this diagram, it requires two rounds of communication before you can actually uh, uh, be sure that it's not gonna um, affect you. Uh, but it's, it, it's, a, it's a discussion worth having. All right, Casa has come out with an inheritance solution. So this is uh, basically a way to uh, do um, recover your Bitcoin if you happen to die. And uh, Casa works out of, on a three of five setup where you keep three of the keys and they keep one of the keys and a, and a fourth one is like, uh, and the fifth one is, I guess, like uh, put in a safety deposit box, something like that. So that's the five. Uh, they're going to introduce a sixth key that's given to an estate lawyer. and. You still only need three. I'm not sure how that six key is derived or if it's really a three of six or something like that, but it makes me nervous because if you have me, uh, if I, if I uh, do something that the government doesn't like, then what they might do is go and sub, uh, get the key from the state lawyer, get the key from CASA and get the key from the safe deposit box. And that would be bad. Um, all right, so, uh, but I don't know how it works. So, um, you know, until they come out with more technical details, I'll withhold judgment. Uh, Hector Roskins uh, also works for CASA. He's published an article for setting up a watch-only wallet using Electrum. And this is, um, like, doing watch-only wallets is very good security practice because you want your private keys to be offline. And a watch-only wallet basically allows you to observe the blockchain and uh, still allow you to receive money into your wallet, just not spend it. And that's a that's a very important thing. And that uh, if you're a holder like me or somebody that's using Bitcoin as a store of value, um, this aspect is uh, is usually the way you want to use it. Is uh, you want to watch only wallet so you can receive Bitcoins, but it thinks uh, but you uh, there's some process involved for you to spend Bitcoins to prevent yourself from spending too much or to have it stolen and so on. All right. Um, Lightning. So Zebedee has this very interesting. Uh, interesting product or uh, really an SDK and Unity is an, a, a game development engine uh, but they basically put something on top of Unity to integrate Lightning into it and this, this is quite exciting because uh, a lot of games have some sort of monetary element this is usually how games are monetized now especially on mobile uh, but having this sort of like uh, ability to pay micro payments through lightning and you can get down to millisats on lightning so you can you can pay like an insanely small amount to play uh to get some ability or something like that this uh should make the entire um you know like th this should enable all sorts of more interesting ways to integrate monetary uh, monetizing or make it uh possible for games to monetize and that's uh, you know, and they, they have a whole developer dashboard and uh, all this other stuff. Um, I, I think this is fantastic. I really hope they come up with something and, um, you know, more, more developers will come, come up with more games that use, use this technology. Economics, engineering, etc. So I'll be reading through the CoinMonks article, but it does go through the uh, stock to flow model and then adds sort of the these two players in a uh, in a game theory perspective, you have holders and you have opportunists, and like basically they interact in an interesting way to cause these bubbles. So um, we'll go through uh, a reading of that uh, later. 
Uh, Coinmetrics has a really thorough article on what happened to BCH SegWit coin. So basically, if you sent money to a SegWit address on BCH, um, there anyone can spend because BCH removed SegWit. Uh, and there was a lot of big, big Bitcoin cash that ended up getting sent to SegWit addresses on BCH. Uh, and it was about 20,000 BCH. And, uh, and basically, uh, this is the story about like how those funds and essentially, uh, you know, what, what happened to those funds. Um, and it, it is a, it's a fascinating article. Uh, as you can see, like, you know, uh, early on, there weren't many, uh, but as time went on, I mean, there were a lot of B, uh, BCH sent to sort of SegWit addresses on BCH. So a lot of people were making some serious mistakes. So there was a, uh, there was essentially a jackpot because anyone can spend them, but you need, uh, they're not relay because it's not standard. So therefore, like all these, um, uh, you have to get the cooperation of a miner in order to include them in a block. And, uh, and somebody managed to do it. And it was an anonymous Reddit user, BCH SegWit Recover, who first did that. And it was uh, 493 and a half BCH, which was like $600,000 uh, at the time. And basically, uh, they he the that user was charging thirty percent in order to send it back, uh, provided that the user could prove that they they actually mistakenly sent it, um, and uh, and that that was a lot of money, and uh, and soon like my miners like BTC.com they they started doing a recovery service, and uh, eventually. Uh, unknown mining pools started coming along and they just took them. So BTC.com, they would take 10% and send them back. Um, unknown, they just kept them. There was no way to recover, right? If you accidentally sent uh, money to a SegWit address on BCH and unmine, uh, unknown took them, you, you had no, uh, no way to get them. So um, really interesting story, but uh, essentially, this explains why BCH had like so many unknown miners on there for a long time because they wanted to take the coins. They didn't want to hit to their reputation, so they mined them um, anonymously and, <laughs> and kept the BCH. Uh, Ethereum is undergoing a proof of work change in July as specified by EIP 1057. Uh, the new algorithm is called Prog POW, and the reason for the change is to make a, uh, Ethereum more ASIC resistant. Now they're not going to proof of work, uh, proof of stake, uh, and they're but they're staying at proof of work. They're just changing mining algorithms, and the reason is because of this boogeyman of miner centralization. So essentially, they're reducing the security for their network um, in order to go and, uh, I don't know, uh, add some perception of more decentralization, even though they're a completely centralized coin. Um, so yeah, I mean, that that's going to have the unfortunate effect of bricking all the uh, ASIC mining equipment that's already on e Ethereum. Uh, and that's uh, that kind of sucks. And, and some people are pretty angry, including this guy on Twitter, Eric.f, I run an Ethereum node and I will refuse to run a Prog POW version of Ethereum. So, um, yeah, this is why running your own node is actually useful, right? Because you you don't have to go through the central dictates of a central uh, authority. And this guy is going to exercise that. If he does, then there will probably be a chain split like Ethereum Classic. And, um, and I talked about it on Tone Show. So I have a bunch of speaking engagements and um, yeah, I, mean, I, I I read through Bit325 this week. I'll be at Bitcoin 2020. I, I, I already told you guys all this. So let's go through my Twitter feed. Actually, let's uh, let's see if there are any questions because there's a lot of comments. Um, all right, 40 Mimble Wimble coin. Okay, uh, Trace doesn't have a lot of Bitcoin. You don't need to scam people on their Bitcoin if he needs to sell a shitcoin to people. So I know Trace from Armory, and I was at Armory back in 2015, 2016. He was an investor. And I know for a fact he has a lot of Bitcoin. So let's just end. Well, at least he did back then. And uh, it would be very difficult to believe for me to believe that he spent that much money in a few years. Um, he's not that kind of person. All right, Jimmy, in your opinion, um, 
In your opinion, will Trace's downfall impact the work that he and Caitlin Long have been doing in the legislative front of Wyoming and more? Well, I mean, honestly, Trace didn't do very much. I, he he lent, lent the support, but the main work was done by Caitlin Long and some other people in Wyoming. Um, uh, Will Cole is a friend of mine, and I, I, I know he did a bunch of stuff there. Uh, the, the legislative stuff is, I mean, I, I don't think he, he, I mean, his reputation's kind of tarnished anyway. Uh, like, I don't think he, it would have gone through whether he supported it or not, right? So I don't, I don't think that really impacts anything. And, um, and you know, I mean, the I, I think Cardano is based out of there and some other, uh, you know, quote unquote blockchain projects. So I mean, th this is, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, so OGs can't resist printing money by altcoin lie central bank can so human. Yep uh, Name one coin besides Bitcoin that you won't call a scam Maybe like Paxos coin or something if they fully Backed it um, I, I'm not sure about tether. I don't know if they fully backed their coins, but if it's something like that I I, I, I I would guess no. Um, Trace nowhere to be found. Yeah, I mean, I would be hiding too if I were him. Uh, there were some. There was some uh, confusion. Adam versus Adam Meister. Yeah, Adam Meister was obviously shilling it, and he was at unconfiscatable uh, to pump it because uh, the interviews that I mentioned on the in the article. Basically, they were on Adam's show, and he was pumping Mimble and Bullcoin um, throughout as well. So, yeah, he, he's just as a bad actor as uh, Trace Mayer. Did they discuss Mimble Wimble dilemma? No. Uh, all right, I guess that's it. All right, let's go back to uh, go to my Twitter feed, and then I'll explain some of my tweets. And go from there. All right. <clears throat> All right. Warren Buffett is good at using debt-based leverage to create a lot of value for himself. He knows how to make money off the fiat system. In other words, he's an expert rent seeker. He's not an expert in technology, economics, game theory, security, or liberty. Okay, Boomer. And this was a subtweet to what was going around at the time, which was, he doesn't own any cryptocurrencies and never plans to. Well, I mean, he's making a crap ton of money off the fiat system. So in, in a sense, I understand why he's saying that, um, but there's no reason why you should listen to him because he's not an expert in any of those things. And uh, actually, I think he's a, I mean, the, the way he's made his money, I, I don't I don't understand why people give him so much respect. It's uh, he's very good at rent seeking. So what? Uh, I mean, that that's not that's not something to be proud of. Uh, the drop from X to X over 3 feels worse than the rise from X over 10 to X feels good. This is why holding is hard. And this is true. There's loss of earning. Uh, people hate losing money uh, way more than they love making money. And, the, um, you know, I mean, like logically, if you go from X over 10 to X to X divided by 3, X divided by 3 is still significantly more than X over 10. And that should still feel good. But uh, not a lot of people view it that way. The whole Trace Mayer MWC thing reminds me of the Tiger Woods scandal. He's not getting out in front of the story and silence just makes him look worse and worse. The decade plus reputation he's built is burning down. Trace, I've known you for a long time. Please don't go out this way. Turns out he went out this way. Um, so I, I've known him since what, like 2015 or so. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's kind of a sad ending to this whole thing that he's, um, you know, I, like his reputation's burnt. I, I don't know how he recovers. Uh, all right, and Nimble Wimble coin as of Tuesday, February 26th was like $4.51. It, that, to be fair, it's like now like 10 bucks or something like that. But it literally dropped like 82% after the, you know, the hot bit thing. Um, and that, that was kind of uh, interesting. Yeah, so San Francisco programming blockchain. I talked about that show, uh, uh, the Trace Mayer thing on Tone show. I did a Signet re bit read through. Bitcoin has made me wary of free stuff money. There's always a cost, not just in time and mind share, but in the corrupting effects of greed, entitlement, and rationalization. And this this is the big thing. Um, if you get something for free, and this is really, uh, you know, not just Trace Mayer, but a lot of people that get stuff for free, um, is that you're not really getting it for free. 
you might think you're getting it for free, but part of you changes as a result of getting it for free because you start thinking better of the thing that you got for free um, because it's now yours. And uh, in a sense, uh, it, it, it has this corrupting effect where uh, you're beholden to greed. You, still, you, you start feeling entitled to whatever you got for free and you rationalize that the fact that you got it for free was actually an economically productive thing. It isn't. And, uh, and like being realistic about that and being honest with yourself uh, is very difficult. Um, and that, that's what I was trying to point out. Pay attention to the news, become addicted. Don't pay attention to the news, become productive. The news media wants you to be in a state of anxiety as it makes it easy for them to get clicks, views. Seriously, stop reading about coronavirus and make something. And this is something that has bothered me is that a lot of people tweet and talk about stuff that they have zero control over, right? Coronavirus is either going to spread and kill everybody or it's not. And there's not much that you can do about it, right? I mean, I guess you can go buy a mask or something like that. But like the, the level of things that people are reading, like reading like statistics on like what happened in a hospital in Thailand or something like that, it's, uh, it's completely unproductive, right? Like just go buy a mask and be done with it and go start making something instead of just being anxious. Because news media wants you to be anxious. They, they care about your anxiety because they want you to continue to read their stories. But reading more stories isn't going to make you feel better. Instead, go deal with it, check that emotion, and go use your energy for something more productive. That was what I was trying to say. The best investing advice for the last 10 years has been free, actionable, and online the whole time. Buy Bitcoin, hold for five years or more. And this is a subtweet of what Naval said, which, which was something like, hey, uh, yeah, nobody gives good, nobody that's any good at investing, um, you know, gives free, actionable advice online. And I've never seen any exception. And I was like, no, there's been a lot of people that have said something about Bitcoin the last uh, many years. All right, I am going to do an AMA with Swan later. Uh, I, I think it's tomorrow, so I'll probably put out a promo for that later today. The world is full of things that are waiting to be created. Are you really going to sit there all day and consume content about things outside of your control? Again, my Twitter feed was just filled up with coronavirus stuff, and it's just absolutely crazy that um, people are that obsessed with something that they really have zero control over uh, and aren't going to make any money from unless you happen to be like a you know vaccine expert or something like that or maybe a product a producer of masks how is it possible that i muted all cub 19 words and still half my feed is about the virus i missed the tweets about epstein world war three with Iran or even the Democratic primary. And this is kind of true. Like, uh, am amazingly, all those stories just blanked. Like, nobody pays attention to any of that anymore because uh, this is what people are anxious about. And th this requires self-discipline. This re requires uh, sort of an, uh, you know, inner self-control to not, like, get carried away with it. And it looks like a lot of people are getting carried away with the coronavirus stuff. All right, when will we be over $10,000 for 30 days in a row? Most people think sometime this year. Um, seems like a reasonable one. CPI is a fraud. It takes focus away from the monetary expansion and prevents apples to apples comparisons. When given a percentage, ask what the denominator is before doing a linear expo uh, expo uh, extrapolation. All right, so basically um, the CPI, like, refuses to give you the denominator, right? Like the monetary expansion is kind of hidden in the CPI. Uh, instead, they give you sort of a basket of goods that they can change at any time and adjust with quality of goods rankings or whatever. And, and the idea is to make you think that it's uh, your money is not infl inflating as much as it is. Um, and, see, it, and that's why I call it a fraud. And similar things are happening all over the place, right? The whole coronavirus thing, for example. Um, which I, I really would know more than, about than I really want to. But, uh, you know, they're, they're saying, oh, 5% of people that get infected die. That's not true. They did a survey of people that were hospitalized, and that 5% of those people end up dying. That's a very different number. And if you look at the denominator, it's the people that were hospitalized for it. You do the same thing for something like pneumonia. Pneumonia... Um, gets about 500,000 people hospitalized for pneumonia um, and about 40,000 of those died. That's about 8%. So 
really coronavirus is actually less like deadly than pneumonia at least for hospitalized people there's tons of people that get the virus and stay home and they end up okay right like so in, in a sense if you're not asking the questions that you need to instead sort of linearly extrapolating and saying oh well you know like there's so so many more uh you know it, it's uh, it's five percent that'll kill like you know a uh, hundred uh, tens of millions of people something like that um you're not really doing the math correctly because it, it, it's statistical shenanigans that, that are causing people to think that. Beware of fake self-sovereignty. Real self-sovereignty takes discipline, rationality, and a low time preference. Fake self-sovereignty indulges FOMO, rationalization, and a high time preference. Like all of this, uh, like, and hopefully you got that feeling from the rest of the feed is that you, you really need some self-discipline and rationalization, uh, you know, using your rational mind to, you know, sort of compartmentalize some of the, the stuff. Um, that's what real self-sovereignty is. If anyone can manipulate you by, um, you know, fudding or uh, inducing anxiety in you, then you're, you're going, you're going to have a bad time, right? Because you, you can always be controlled. Then, then you're not really self-sovereign and, uh, being, being able to sort of ward off your personal attack surface, as I would call it, um, that, that's a, that's a big part of being self-sovereign is having that self-control and discipline to not be so vulnerable to these attacks of anxiety or FOMO or rationalization or whatever. And of course, uh, my article from uh, this morning. So uh, anyway, let's uh, that that's it for my uh, Twitter feed. There's been a bunch more um, comments. I don't see any questions. Uh, so. All right, let's uh, let's talk about the actual um, article from Coin Monks. Um, I, I thought this was an amazing read and I, I, I really enjoyed it. All right. So let's let's go back to the beginning. The whole hodlers game. Game theory applied to Bitcoin pricing. This is from, um, I'm not sure who he is, Muhu. Um, introduction, the holder, holder's game model is meant to diff, offer a different perspective about two of the currently most discussed topics in the Bitcoin community. Is the stock to flow model accurate and is the having price in? Most opinions have already been stated within the community, but most from a technical IT statistical uh, statistics point of view, or just out of gut feelings. This model will add an economics point of view to the discussion. Overall, it will investigate two questions. Will we continue to see a similar price volatility and price cycles? And if yes, why? All right, concepts of money and scarcity. An asset needs to meet several attributes to be considered money. For example, durable, divisible, portable, uniform, scarce, and some more. Many digital assets easily meet many of these attributes, except for scarcity and as, uh, as the same digital asset can be infinitely copied. Bitcoin is considered the truly first truly scarce digital asset. Some even consider it one of the scarcest resources on earth as its supply is irreversibly fixed and 100% no. And scarcity is one of the very few factors that makes something valuable. The stock to flow ratio is meant to measure scarcity. It divides the existing stockpiles, uh, over res stockpiles or reserves of the specific act asset by its yearly supply or growth rate. Therefore, the higher the stock to flow ratio, the lower the price elasticity of the supply. So basically, uh, if there's more stock and not much coming in, then you're going to, uh, the supply isn't able to enter as much. A supply with a low price elasticity is very inflexible to demand volatility, which has an amplified effect on the asset price. Economists have found that the S to F ratio has a strong correlation to assets prices and introduce Bitcoin's stock to flow ratio, safety and honest, the Bitcoin standard. Following this observation, Plan B developed a model based on Bitcoin stock to flow ratio to predict future price developments, Plan B 2019. The stock to flow model demonstrates that up until today, Bitcoin price can very accurately be modeled by this model and that Bitcoin's price will continue to increase stepwise after each halving, following S to F ratios pattern, figure one. And this is a well-known one for a lot of people that uh, know about uh, you know, Bitcoin stock to flow and so on. Holdler's game model observations. Based on observations, the holdler's game model assumes two different types of people to partic participate in the market, holdlers and opportunists. 
Hodlers are long-term investors who already almost hold as many Bitcoins as they feel comfortable with. Most have reached their maximum risk financial exposure. Opportunists, on the other hand, are newcomers and or traders with a short middle-term uh, investment horizon. Holdlers tend to accumulate during low volatility periods and to sell during incurring price spikes, while opportunists take the other side of the trade and kickstart the volatility when they entered the market, figure two. So uh, figure two, liveliness is defined as the ratio of the sum of coin days destroyed and the sum of all coin days uh, ever created. Liveliness increases as long-term holder uh, liquidate positions and decreases while they accumulate to hold. Holders are selling their holding when the price increases, rebuy them during downturns, and accumulate in low volatility phases. So essentially what holders do is um, they tend to sell during spikes and we accumulate during uh, low volatility times. And this is what, uh, you know, I mean, basically what you're doing is you have as much money in Bitcoin as you feel comfortable. You sell near the peak to sort of pay expenses for yourself. And then you uh, use whatever you're not, you, uh, you haven't used for uh, paying expenses to accumulate Bitcoin again. And that tends to be a pretty, uh, you know, like coin days destroyed or liveliness ratio seems to have a pretty uh, nice correlation here. Uh, game theory. In the holdlers game model, both participants have been attributed strategies that they typically use in different market cycles, corresponding to the behavior described above. Depending on the strategy of the opponent, the player's potential payout utility will differ for each of his strategies. These payouts are attributed subjectively based on observation and experience. In a game theory setup, participants behave as to maximize their payouts, red circle. The situation when both players' best response strategy matches two red circles in the same matrix intersection is called a Nash equilibrium. So uh, basically, buy, hold, and sell are the three options for holder, uh, holders. Um, and basically, the Nash equilibrium for holders is when they're both holding, right? Like. Um, Neither of them uh, will buy at the same time and neither of them will sell at the same time. They sell during the peak and they buy during, uh, during, the, uh, during the trough. So um, you, you, the only equilibrium that you're going to get there is they're both going to hold. If only holders existed, then that's what would happen. So when you have opportunists and the holders, um, let me see what the axis is. Uh, so, so when the opportun opportunists only really buy and sell, right? Because they, they don't hold. They're, they're really looking for sort of like a quick buck. Um, so when holders are buying, opportunists are also buying. And this is near the peak. Uh, when holders are holding, opportunists are also buying. And when holders are selling, oppor uh, opportunists are also buying. So you, you have all of that. Um, holders uh, want to hold when buyers are buying sometimes um, and holders want to sell when their buyers are buying. So, um, you know, and they, they both want to sell near the top and that, that happens sometimes, but uh, kind of rarely. So when holders are, um, yeah, so at, at phase, so this is phase two and then at phase three, um, when the opportunists are about to leave, the buyers, uh, you know, and holders uh, will hold or buy um, or sell, I guess. Well, okay, so I'm not, I'm not sure about this but last one. The model shows that during the re reaccumulation phase, holders will retain a more or less constant positive buying pressure by either buying or holding. The reason for it is that they have almost reached their maximum bearable exposure and would rather see the price increase without further increasing their own exposure. This constant and rather light buying pressure slows down the previous crash, stabilizes and slowly increases the um, price again, a uh, flat U shape. So holders will slowly buy, slowly buy. And it's because they are, most of them are already exposed as much as they want. And it's really new income that they're, that's coming in that they're putting towards buying more. So this would be like dollar cost averaging or whatever that holders actually do. The halving by cutting Bitcoin supply in half in combination with constant buying pressure will continue to slowly increase price and volatility 
because holders won't change their strategy because of that event. The increased price volatility soaks in new, more opportunists in an upwards vicious cycle while holders start to sell. So the holders will start to sell during that sort of uh, upwards uh, you know, vicious cycle because um, more opportunists enter, but holders, you know, um, you know, they, they might be buying, but they might also be st selling. I guess uh, if, if you've already run out of runway, then you start selling a little bit. Uh, the dominant but uh, but the supply from miners um, cuts in half. So there isn't as much supply. So you, you need that extra supply from current holders that causes sort of an increase in price uh, slowly at first. The dominant strategy for opportunists here is to buy. No matter what the opponent does, buying will offer them the highest payouts while selling is the weekly dominant strategy for holders. So it's a weekly dominant strategy for holders, meaning that um, you can sell and still make some money because you bought at the previous, uh, like during this accumulation phase, but they're very reluctant to do so, right? Because they are holders and they only do it when they have to. This dynamic goes up until the point the price crashes back as not enough opportunists continue to enter the market. So that continues for a while where, where um, holders will weakly sell, but buyers will ragingly buy. And then uh, not enough opportunists are in, and then you enter phase three. Bitcoin is still considered a very risky market and the majority of people are still afraid of it. Therefore, the pool of potential buyers ready to enter the market quickly dries out. At this point, holders buy back their holdings as buying is now their weekly dominant strategy along with holdable as an option, while selling is the dominant strategy for opportunists. So, um, you know, you, uh, you may have sold some before and now you start buying back because, uh, you know, you, you have some of that money or you, you haven't spent as much as you thought. Um, so th this is the game that they're playing. The exiting of opportunists leaves at the end, a majority of holders left in the market, which naturally leads to buy hold equilibrium. This goes back to phase one, where most people are holding, but there's some buying sort of on a dollar cost averaging model. Uh, the predicted behavior by the holders game model, the Nash equilibrium, in which no player has a profitable deviation, um, matches the behavior observed under real conditions. By definition, this fact implies that the participant's behavior is rational and predictable as it is the re result of rational strategic decision-making in equilibria. The described rationality and predictability by the holders game model has several implications. implications. First implication. The first implication is that similar price cycles, reaccumulation periods followed by spikes, will continue to occur in the future, a prediction that is in line with the S2F model. Additionally, every major opportunist entry exit period was accomplished, accompanied by massive volatility, a period during which respective S2F ratios were major outliers in the S2F model. So basically, um, he, uh, we're explaining the fact that there's deviations from the stock to flow model by the fact that you have a bunch of opportunists that sort of change uh, the game for holders. Uh, so it's now weekly um, profitable for holders to sell. At that point, uh, you know, like more opportunists come in uh, and, and having triggers all this because the supplies cut in half and, uh, you know, it, it requires more, uh, the price tends to go up to, and, you know, it, it requires more holders to um, put money into the market and so on. But uh, the biggest deviations happen during those times when opportunists come in. Therefore, it seems likely that the price will continue to exceed normal pr predicted price by this S2F model during the next opportunist entry periods if conditions remain constant. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, the highest volatility days, positive and negative, are gathered around three major periods, and those are the uh, right around the halving. Um, the highest volatility days S2F ratios coincide with the most extreme S2F model outliers. So here are the outliers in the S2F model, and basically, those those are explained by the opportunist uh, holder game model. Uh, second implication. The second impl implication is that future price cycles rely on opportunists converting to holders after each cycle. If the cycles were constituted only of flat reaccumulation phases with price spikes. The average price would re remain rather flat, like EGG di ECG diagrams. So how does it increase stepwise as demonstrated by this S2F model? After each cycle, some opportunists convert to being holders, which increases the pool of long-term market participants. These participants, holders, 
are responsible for holding up the price at higher levels during the following reaccumulation phase, the next step in the S2F model. So every time there's this uh, crazy uh, price rise, you have a bunch of opportunists that's, that, that stick around and, and become the new holders. Um, and, and they accumulate uh, slowly during sort of the down times. And then uh, it's weekly profitable for them to sell during the next run up. Uh, but then all the opportunists that enter, some of them stay. And that, that, that's the new baseline um, each time. Uh, third uh, implication. The third and most interesting implication is that Bitcoin's having is not priced in. The reality is much more nuanced. Holders are aware of the future havings and have an idea how much Bitcoin should be worth. However, it is not priced accordingly as holders lack the less necessary resources to do so. I wish I had X Bitcoins. Unfortunately, I can't afford to buy that many. The total aggregated value of resources willing to seriously evaluate and invest long term in Bitcoin are dwarfed by the value they estimate Bitcoin has. This fact hinders the market to price Bitcoin correspondingly to the value its participants estimate it has. Thus, paradoxically, the fact that Bitcoin's price continues to rise over time is simply partly due to the lack of resources at each point in time. So, in other words, I would love to buy more Bitcoin, right? But I don't have the resources to do so or like this is uh, any holder that that um, that's holding don't want to put any more money in. And um, and it's because they're that that's the limit that they're at. And and they they think that Bitcoin is going to go up. And if they have more resources at their uh, at their disposal, they would price it in. But um, unfortunately, it's not infinite. So uh, it, it ends up not being priced in as a result. Uh, opportunists who were first attracted by uh, growing volatility and who remain in the market for the long term after the halving are responsible for the significant long term price increases. Therefore, one can say halvings are helping to market uh, to price uh, Bitcoin more efficiently by att attracting additional resources into Bitcoin's pricing. So in other words, the more holders there are, the more accurate that Bitcoin's price will adhere to um, the uh, stock to flow model and we're still in that phase where it's still being adopted so you're going to have that volatility and uh, conversion from opportunist to holders is really what this is all about consequently one can assume that bitcoin's uh, bitcoin will have the possibility to be correctly valued as soon as the resources available to value it exceeds the value holders attribute to it when this condition is met we can assume that future halvings will be priced in thus breaking the s2f model stepwise sharp increases will be smooth a factor to accelerate this process is the opportunist learning curve and that of the general public, as it will influence how fast the critical valuation will be reached. Obviously, holders realizing they overvalue Bitcoin, unrealistic expectations, regulations, etc., or the pool of potential opportunists drying out will also break the S2F model and Bitcoin's continual cycle, price, cyclical price increase. Conclusion. The holder's game model shows that Bitcoin's price, which is deemed to be uh, by many to be irrational, is in fact the result of rational behavior. This rationality offers a certain predictability as to how future price cycles will look like. One important condition for it to hold true is the market participant dynamics to stay constant. Opportunists entering the market in ways with a small portion staying for the long term with holders uh, supporting the price level during the longer time periods. So um, essentially what it's saying is uh, each time there's a bunch of opportunists that come in during the price, right? And uh, I think we know pretty much you know, anecdotally this happens, right? Like you get phone calls from random people saying, hey, do you, do you know about Bitcoin? What should I do? Um, it happens during the, the during uh, around these halvings um, as uh, opportunists sort of come in. Uh, the opportunists don't just set the price, though. It's the holders that set the price. And, uh, and they, they're the ones with the Bitcoin. And uh, until those opportunists uh, convert to holders, then, then you have a new baseline to go with. Um, all right, let's see if there's uh, anything else, uh, any other questions. Uh, Jimmy, can Europeans get a scholarship for your course in Antwerp? Yes, please apply. Having is not possible because it is supply, not news. Uh, yeah, uh, all right, well, so, I mean, uh, there's no question there, so. Um, Anyway, that is about it for today. Hopefully you learned something. Uh, again, I'm going to be at Bitcoin 2020 later this month. I, uh, my book, Programming Bitcoin, is available on Amazon, as is the Little Bitcoin book. And my seminar, Programming Blockchain in San Francisco, in Antwerp, um, uh, is uh, March 25th, 26th, and April 22nd, 23rd. 
Um, you can look at all of uh, all of this apply now. There's also a link for the scholarship. You can just click that if you want to apply. It looks like this. Um, and if you want to apply for Antwerp, just check Antwerp. That's it. Um, all right. So that is it for today. Uh, let me go to the main desktop. Fiat de lenda est this song.